Well, good afternoon and welcome back to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another jam-packed episode, just like we have every single week. Sometimes we have more content that we know what to do with. But we're going to uh, actually start off today with a little bit of Hollywood. Who doesn't love Hollywood as far as the, a lot of their products? Um, the Academy Awards uh, nominations have been announced and some people are not happy. Now, I know I usually go out to a few movies. This last year has been no exception. Uh, unlike last year where I gave film reviews, I just hadn't, we had too much material. I haven't had time to give you film critiques and film reviews. Uh, but I did go out and see uh, Creed, of course, uh, Star Wars, um, The Force Awakens, and uh, what else did I see? The Peanuts movie, just because there's a lot of St. Paul references, and you know, from my childhood, I've always enjoyed the Peanuts characters. Uh, I did see the In the Heart of the Sea, so I did go out and see a fair number of films this this um, last year. And now that it's Academy Awards time, somebody's not happy. It always seems that every year at this time, we always hear about somebody who feels snubbed for the Oscars. And I, I was just asked, did you see the film 13 Hours? Not yet. I will be seeing it but uh, at some point in time, but I'm not exactly sure when. Uh, and, and, and the reason is for something that we're going to be discussing later on in this program. And I think you know, if you hang on, you'll find out the reason why. Uh, but right now, we've got Spike Lee and Jada Pinkett Smith. They are calling for an Oscar boycott. They are not happy. Somebody got snubbed. Let's go to the film. There were many strong performances by black actors in 2015, from the origin story of a groundbreaking rap group to a boxing film that punched above its weight, or the heart-wrenching story of a commander of children. But you won't find any of them in the Oscar nominations, just as there were no actors of color in the nominees from 2014. Today, Jada Pinkett Smith, wife of Will Smith, put the Academy on notice. Begging for acknowledgement or even asking diminishes dignity. Smith says she will not be attending or watching the show, and she wasn't alone. Thank you. Although he was awarded an honorary Oscar last year, director Spike Lee used Instagram to tell the Academy he won't return, and the problem is bigger than the awards. It's in the executive office of the Hollywood Studios and TV and cable networks. This is where the gatekeepers decide what gets made. I think this whole debate has made people in Hollywood deeply uncomfortable, and that's a great thing. <laughs> the TIFF artistic director points to the boxing film Creed as an example of racism in the Academy. Great director uh, Ryan Coogler, a great performance by Michael B. Jordan, but even then, what's recognized by the Academy voters is not the, the two leads in that film. It's Sylvester Stallone's comeback performance, which is strong, but it, for me, it's not the only thing going on there. Part of the problem is the roughly 6,100 Academy voters who choose the nominees, a group that is mostly male and 94% white. The Academy has made inviting more diverse members a priority, but even the president is exasperated. Oh, yes, it's frustrating. It is frustrating. Um, and we just have to keep working at it. You know, I mean, this is about recognizing talent. Today in London, Idris Elba, overlooked for his role in Beasts of No Nation, told Parliament Britain needs to do more to nurture diverse talent. Now, talent is everywhere, but opportunity isn't. Talent can't reach opportunity unaided. Looking at last year's box office, you can see the Academy is out of step with audiences. From Star Wars to Furious 7, film fans flock to movies with a range of characters. And with Oscar host Chris Rock already teasing the Academy on Twitter, the Oscars so white issue could steal the show. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Black Christian. Well, there we have it. People are feeling snubbed in Hollywood. But here's the thing. It all starts, of course, with Jada Pickett-Smith. Jada Pickett-Smith is the wife of Will Smith, who is formerly known as the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And I'm, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, if you remember back in the late 80s and early 90s, this is kind of how Will Smith, the actor, really came onto the scene. He was a rapper, and then he ended up starring in this TV show. And now, of course, he, this last year, he came out with a film Concussion, 
which I have not seen yet. Uh, that's one on my list of uh, films to see. But I'll tell you this, Concussion was not well received at the box office. It did not make that much money. And then two, there's a lot of criticisms coming on Will's perform Will Smith's performance in Concussion because he had to take on a Nigerian accent and he wasn't really able to pull it off and that really upset a lot of the Nigerians. So, you know, is that kind of performance worthy of being nominated for the Academy Award? Well, now that we have this controversy, let's hear from Aunt Viv, Janet Hubert, who had uh, played the Aunt Viv character on his show, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. She's got some unique things to say. Blacktress Janet Hubert <coughs> coming to you, not in a post, but sort of in a post. And um, I got to say, um, I, I've been trying to figure out, do, do I really want to do this? And yeah, I do. I do. Today being um, the celebration of Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday and hitting 60 years old, I just, I'm at that point where I'm like, uh-uh, I don't give a kitty. I want to say something about um, Jada Pinkett Smith asking other actors, black black actors and actresses, to boycott the Oscars. Uh, first of all, Miss Thing, um, does your man not have a mouth of his own with which to speak? And the second thing is, girlfriend, there's a lot of shit going on in the world that you all don't seem to recognize people are dying our boys are being shot left and right uh, people are hungry people are starving people are trying to pay bills and you talk about some actors uh in oscars and it, it just ain't that deep and here's the other thing for you to ask other actors and other black actresses and black uh, actors to jeopardize their career and they're standing in a town that you know damn well. You don't do that. And here's the other thing, they don't care. They don't care. And I find it ironic that somebody who has made their living, made their living and made millions and millions of dollars um, from the very people that you're talking about boycotting just because you didn't get a nomination, just because you didn't win, that is not the way life works, baby. Okay, and it it's very suspect to me, and I seem to recall hmm twenty maybe six seven years ago twenty five whatever it was what what look I don't even remember but I seem to remember at option time coming to you and saying you know what well you're the star of the show why don't we all get together and with you maybe we could get a little raise maybe the network since you know the show is such a hit. And you being the star of the show, your influence would help us greatly, like they did on Friends, like white shows do. Remember that? Do you remember that? Because I do. Mm. And your response to me was, my deal is my deal and y'all deal is y'all deal. Well, karma must be a bitch because now here you are. Here you are. You've had a few flops. And you know... There are those out there who really deserved a nod, and Idris Elba was one of them. Lord have mercy. Beast of No Nation was incredible. That man is an incredible actor. You are not. Maybe you didn't deserve uh, a nomination. I, I didn't think, frankly, you deserved a Golden Globe nomination with that accent, but you got one. And just because the world don't go the way you want it to go, doesn't mean that you can go out and then you start asking people to stand up and sing, We Shall Overcome for You. Mm. You ain't Barack and Michelle Obama, and y'all need to get over yourselves. You have a huge production company that you only produce your friends, your family, and yourself. So you are a part of Hollywood. You are a part of the system that is unfair to other actors. So get real. Now, for those of you who say, Miss Huber, here she go, here she go, here she go being bitter. Please, it's not about being bitter. It's about being right. You know, some of us got mortgages to pay. We got bills to pay. We got bigger shit to worry about than the Oscars. The only Oscar I care about right now is Oscar Maya Wiener with mustard and relish. And on that note, Black Christianity Hubert signing off. Peace, baby. Okay, a couple quick thoughts, and I'm going to take a further discussion to my Periscope. Number one, 
As soon as she said, first of all, Miss Thing, I knew uh, Will and Jada was in trouble. Number two, she may come off as bitter, but just because you're bitter doesn't mean you're wrong. Number three, Will, uh, he got a lot of heat for the accent, especially from Nigerians. I can see that point. Number four, Idris Elba absolutely deserved an Oscar nomination for his work in Beast of No Nation. Number five, the only Oscar she's here for is Oscar Meyer Wiener. Woo! Number six, Will and Jada, you have upset Jenna Hubert. She is not here for neither one of y'all nor y'all work. She said you barely, I didn't think you deserved a Golden Globe, but you got that. Number seven, I'd love to know what you guys think. Like I said, it'll take a longer discussion over the Periscope where it's easy to interact. But I'd love to know what you guys have thought right here on YouTube in the comment section. See you tomorrow. And boycotting the Academy Awards for being too white. I guess they won't be voting in the Democrat primaries. Two white guys and a white woman. Just leave that up there for just a second. There we go. And that's kind of what's going on here is we're talking about all this diversity. And the question really is, what did Martin Luther King really, Jr. really stand for? What was all of that civil rights protesting back in the 60s? Uh, what did the Tuskegee Airmen fight for in World War II? What, did, what barrier did Jackie Robinson uh, break back, you know, back in the 50s and 60s? Or it might have been 40s. I can't remember when Jackie Robinson was around. Uh, the fact is, it, this really brings up a larger question, a more important question. And it's, we, we see this with Black Lives Matter. You can't go out to a uh, Black Lives Matter protest and say, hey, folks, all lives matter. No, that's not acceptable. All lives matter. No, we can't accept that. But we only have to accept our small little class. And I say small as a percentage of the population with about 320 million people in this country. The African American population, while substantial, is still a, a smaller minority. Uh, maybe I'll take a look at the demographics. But the fact is, Martin Luther King Jr., who we celebrate on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, which is last Monday, he ended up coming out and trying to have the African-American folks to be on the same playing field with everybody else. And that's one of the reasons why he's so revered from people who are both in the African-American community and non-African-American community, is that Martin Luther King Jr. wanted racial inclusion. He did not want segregation. He wanted integration. But what are we seeing now? We're seeing, oh, well, I didn't get my way, so I'm going to boycott the Oscars because it's too white. We're going to have Black Lives Matter because we can't include us with everybody else. We've got to be separate. And another actress from the uh, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air series came out and pretty much said the same thing just uh, last week. Stacy Dash. This morning, there's some growing outrage with some over the lack of diversity in this year's list of Oscar nominees. Filmmaker Spike Lee and actress Jada Pinkett Smith say they're not going to go to the Oscars next month after an all-white list of nominees was announced for the major categories for a second year in a row. Join us now to weigh in, actress and Fox News contributor Stacey Dash. Stacey, good morning to you. Good morning. Well, what do you think about this? I think it's ludicrous. Why? Because... We have to make up our minds. Either we want to have segregation or integration. And if we don't want segregation, then we need to get rid of channels like BET and the BET Awards and the Image Awards, where you're only awarded if you're black. If it were the other way around, we would be up in arms. It's a double standard. So you say there shouldn't be a BET channel? No, I don't think so, no. Just like there shouldn't be a Black History Month. You know, we're Americans, period. That's it. Are you saying there shouldn't be a Black History Month because there isn't a White History Month? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Al Sharpton has uh, uh, jumped on the, this boycott bandwagon. He says, don't watch because Hollywood, here's a quote, Hollywood has become like the Rocky Mountains. The higher you get, the whiter. The whiter you get. Well, that's not necessarily true. And if it is, you know, that needs to change. What I find astounding is that we've had a president who is black in office for the past eight years, who gets most of his funding from the liberal elite in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Yet there are not very many roles for people of color. How can that be? And why is it just now being addressed? I, I can understand, Jada, 
uh, Pinkett Smith's frustration that her husband wasn't nominated yeah. for, you know, he did a great job in the movie uh, Concussion. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, what does that say about how people are selected for these awards? Right. That's assuming they're selected by race, which I, I think would be a very dis a disservice to the people who are looking at the films and making the choices. Maybe they knew they need to be more, you know, integrated and, and, and there need to be more diverse people in the process of electing. In the academy. In the academy. Uh, the, the demographics of the academy apparently are, are secret, but for the most part, according to some investigation out in Hollywood, yeah. it's uh, predominantly uh, white males. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. So maybe that says something about who they select, or are, are they looking for that, or the best movies and the best actors? I, I hope they're looking for the best movies and the best actors. The good news is that there's attention brought to it now. But like I said, over the past eight years, we've had a president black who gets his funding mainly from Hollywood, the elite liberals. Yeah. So it's odd to me that this has now become such an issue. Well, let's see uh, what happens, because uh, they are calling for people not to watch it. Let's see if the ratings go down. Yeah, I doubt it. By the way, <laughs> before you go, happy birthday. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's her birthday today. All right, thank Stacey. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck to you today <laughs> and every day. Talking about not needing black entertainment television, about not needing a black Miss America, but we are one country. We are America. And that's exactly the thing that I've been saying now for about 20 to 25 years. Uh, but being that I'm a white guy, I don't have the credibility within the black community to, in which to speak. Uh, that's just the way it goes. I accept that. I'm, I'm not going to you know, boycott the black community. No, not at all. Uh, but the thing is, you know, there is prejudice in Hollywood. And that's what Stacey Dash faces because she's a conservative. And I was just reading on her uh, Wikipedia page just a moment ago because uh, I remember her when she was brought up back in 2012 for switching her political affiliation from Democrat. She voted for Barack Obama in 2008, and she changed that in 12 to uh, Republican to vote for uh, the Romney Ryan ticket. And she really, got, I mean, she faced death threats on Twitter, and she came out and made a tweet that said, you know. Everybody has an opinion, and mine counts too. I can't remember exactly what what she had said, but you know that's that's pretty much what she said. And and I have to commend her for not backing down, for for being vocal. Um, and she is right that it's it's good that this is being brought up because I really think that this is a larger issue, not just in Hollywood. Hollywood is just kind of the battleground right now. But we saw this in Ferguson. We saw this in Baltimore. We saw that in. Uh, Black Lives Matter protests throughout the country, including our own area. And I was at the uh, uh, Black Lives Matter protest at the State Fair. I shot video. I was the first person to actually bring, you know, get that televised. And so, you know, there is an active movement. But, you know, again, with the anniversary of Martin Luther King's birth, you know, this begs the question, what exactly is the me message and mission of Martin Luther King, Jr.? And I believe firmly that it was to get the black man and black woman on the same standing as the white men and white women. And there was nothing wrong with that. And what Martin Luther King Jr. did in, in the South, especially in Selma and crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge, you know, that's the kind of stuff that actually, actually has to be commended because it, it really went in the face of a punitive system based on race. But just because you get snubbed from, the, from Hollywood, conservatives have been snubbed from Hollywood for years. And maybe now it's time that people face up to the fact that the system in Hollywood is broken. I mean, I'm just taking a quick look here. And go ahead and Dallas, if we can put my computer on the screen. This is just to go, goes to show about, um, you know, whether or not a film makes money in Hollywood is worthy of an Academy Award. Let's take a look at just, this is adjusted for inflation. Let's take a look. The number one domestic gross, just the United States, adjusted for inflation is Gone with the Wind from 1939. A, uh, an adjusted gross of $1,757,788,200. Number two is 1977 Star Wars. $1.5 billion adjusted gross. 
Number three, 1965's The Sound of Music, $1.239 billion. E.T. 1982, $1.234 billion. Then Titanic in 1997 with $1.178. The Ten Commandments, 1956, $1.139 billion. Jaws from 1975, $1.114 billion. Dr. Zhivago's number eight at $1.079. And so we have eight films that are in the over the billion dollar mark in the adjusted gross all-time tickets. Now, if you take a look at the top three, Gone with the Wind, Star Wars, and The Sound of Music, the top three, they are really grand sweeping dramas with a hint of romance. That's really what they are. All three of those films, they're really fabulous, fine films. And we can see that through what you know, you actually have with the box office return. And I have adjusted for inflation simply because it's the only thing to get the different eras on the same, same uh, level playing field. Star Wars The Force Awakens, that comes in at number 12, and it's only been out on the, in the theaters for about 36 days. <laughs> wow, it's made $868 million in about 36 days. And, of course, there are changes to the Hollywood system, and by that I mean in, in the way, like Gone on the Wind, you had to go and see that at the theater. There was no home box office, no home market. There was no cable or satellite TV pegging you with the, with the film. Star Wars was kind of the same thing. This is before the home entertainment market. Same with Sound of Music. E.T. was just before that. Uh, but then Titanic was just a really huge picture. And people went multiple times like they did with the other films. So, you know, that's really what we should be looking at when we're looking at Hollywood. This um, pat my back, I'm going to feel really good about myself. Hey, you know, it feels really good, but really in the long perspective of things, an Academy Award is pretty much irrelevant. And part of it's because of the fact that the Academy's made it that way. They've snubbed a lot of great pictures. I really thought that... Um, American Sniper should have won for Best Picture last year. But the fact that it was the top grossing film of the year really didn't have much to play on the fact that it was, you know, it had some political controversy, so they stayed away. That's the way the, the Academy is. So, you know, we get that. You know, what do good movies come from? They're strong stories, for one. Very strong stories. And then, two, a lot of them have heroism and they have a love interest. And really, that's the recipe for a good film. Of course, adding in good acting, good talent, good casting, good directing, and good marketing. But really, every good movie and every good book, it has the same type of formula. But anyhow, now that we got Hollywood out of the way, we're going to move on to reality check. We also had a presidential debate between the Democrats last week. Uh, Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. We're going to take a look at their discussion of Middle East policy and which one is correct. Well, Senator Bernie Sanders and former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton made several statements during their latest debate about America's Middle East policy. Tonight, their path forward, really, is it just a repeat of the past? This is a reality check you won't see anywhere else. No, I think the vacuum was created uh, by the disastrous war in Iraq. Uh, which I vigorously oppose. Not only did I vote against it, I helped lead the opposition. Uh, and what happened there is, yeah, it's easy to get rid of a two-bit dictator like Saddam Hussein, but there wasn't the kind of thought as to what happens the day after you get him and what kind of political vacuum occurs and who rises up. Con groups like ISIS. That was Senator Bernie Sanders explaining why, unlike former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, he voted against the Iraq war in the first place, and how that war left behind a power vacuum that ultimately allowed the rise of ISIS. Sanders is actually correct. If we're talking specifically about the country of Iraq, the biggest contributor to the rise of ISIS there is a place called Camp Bucca. Camp Bucca was a U.S. military detention facility where some of Iraq's most dangerous insurgents were sent. But here's the thing. 
An ISIS commander has told the UK Guardian that Camp Bucha actually brought together the leadership of ISIS in a way that could never have happened without it. Quote, it made it all. It built our ideology, he told the UK Guardian last December. We could never have got all together like this in Baghdad or anywhere else. It would have been impossibly dangerous. Here, we are not only safe, but we were only a few hundred meters away from the entire Al-Qaeda leadership. As for Clinton, she continues to defend her Iraq war vote and claims that the power vacuum in the region was created by Syrian President Assad, not by the U.S. war in Iraq. It is amplified by Assad, who has waged one of the bloodiest, most terrible attacks on his own people, 250,000 plus dead, millions fleeing, causing this vacuum that has been filled, unfortunately, by terrorist groups, uh, including ISIS. But that statement is false. Clinton is making the same argument that many Republican candidates have been making, one which we have disproven repeatedly here in Reality Check, that a major reason for the rise of ISIS is Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. As we've shown you, including a leaked government DIA document, the United States, the Saudis, Israel, Jordan and Qatar, they actually created ISIS by funding groups in Syria in order to overthrow Assad. But what was surprising during Sunday's debate is that Senator Sanders, he actually said he supports removing Assad as well. But I think in terms of our priorities in the region, our first priority, priority must be the destruction of ISIS. Our second priority must be getting rid of Assad through some political settlement, working with Iran, working with Russia. So what you need to know is that the path forward advocated by Sanders and by Clinton is actually the path backward. If Assad is removed first, ISIS takes Syria, no question. But even if ISIS is destroyed and then Assad is removed, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, Al-Nusra, the same ideology under different names takes control. We have seen it happen time and time again. Remember the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over while hoping for a different result. That's Reality Check. Let's talk about that tonight on Twitter. And now that we are only 51 weeks away from the next presidential inauguration, you know, will one of those two people become the Democrat nominee? Well, pretty certain one of those two will. Will they become a president? We'll find out. A lot more to go into it, into it between uh, you know, now and Election Day. But I wanted to point out that back on... Uh, December 5th, I'm looking at our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash North Star Oasis. Uh, back on December 5th, we actually covered the origin of ISIS. And then we also had touched on ISIS on our December 26th show. And you can go to our YouTube channel and get all of our, our, our archives. And with that clip we just shown you from Ben Swan's reality check, that pretty much says the same thing that we told you last month on the origin of ISIS and how it was impacted by Assad. And we, we went really into the, in depth into that. So if you want to know more, there's the opportunity because we actually covered that pretty intently on this, on this very program. So our uh, December 5th and December 26th episodes. And then we're also going to take a look right now. And oh, before we do that, I wanted to just do an update on Real Clear Politics for the Iowa uh, caucuses. Um, the Real Clear Politics average of polls shows that Hillary Clinton has 47.9% to Bernie Sanders 41.5%. There was one poll that came out by CNN last week that stated that Bernie had taken the lead 51 to 43, but that is pretty much an outlier. I looked in, in depth um, in, uh, in the methodology, and they say on here a 6% uh, margin of error, and really there's some areas that were 8.5%. So really, they're just saying it's statistically tied, but you know we don't care. We're going to give you our result. Uh, but a lot of the polls do show that Sanders is closing that margin. He is within uh, or right outside the margin of error in most polls. So it's going to be a tight race as we have about nine more days left until the February 1st precinct caucuses. And of course now let's take a look at the Republican side uh, in Iowa. And it says that this web page is not available so my internet connection's down. But really there hasn't been much of a movement amongst uh, Cruz and Trump. The only movement is that they're attacking each other. And then we're also getting attacks for on um, uh, Marco Rubio. He's getting attacked by Cruz and he's also getting attacked by Bush. And 
Uh, and, and when I say caucus, I'm talking about the Iowa caucuses. I'm not talking about the Minnesota caucuses. That's another month away. But uh, as we head into the Iowa caucuses, uh, Cruz and Trump are still battling for the lead. Um, and um, Marco Rubio is in third place. And my Internet's finally come back. So we have Trump 28.7, Cruz 26.2, Rubio at 11.8. And Ben Carson is continuing his decline. He's falling to 8.8%, and everybody else is five or less. Uh, but let's see what's happening between Ted Cruz and Donald Trump, because things are heating up. I'm Ted Cruz, and I approve this message. Eminent domain, fancy term for politicians seizing private property to enrich the fat cats who bankroll them, like Trump. I think eminent domain is wonderful. It made him rich. Like when Trump colluded with Atlantic City insiders to bulldoze the home of an elderly widow for a limousine parking lot at his casino. He doesn't have no heart, that man. Trump won't change the system. He's what's wrong with it. What we're going to do is we're going to have a country with spirit. We're going to have a country with pizzazz. We're going to have a country that works. We're going to use our smartest and our brightest people. And I know who they are. I know so many. You know, I've, I've been there. I've seen the greatest negotiators in the world. I know some that are overrated, some that are underrated, some you never heard of. But we're going to use real people. We're going to use the people that know how to do it. They're using right now political hacks. They're using people that gave campaign contributions. I mean, you give a campaign contribution to Ted Cruz, you get whatever the hell you want, okay? Whatever you want. And he's a very nice guy, but you give him. You have to get, right? <laughs> You have to get, well, excuse me, excuse me. He didn't report his bank loans, excuse me. Didn't report his bank loans? Say whatever you want. He didn't report bank loans, that's okay. He didn't report his bank loans. He's got bank loans from Goldman Sachs. He's got bank loans from Citibank folks. And then, and then, and then he acts like Robin Hood. You know, say whatever you want, but it doesn't work that way. So we have to use our best people. We have to be smart. We have to be tough. We have to be vigilant, and we can do it, and we can make America greater than ever before. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So that's what's going on. Ted Cruz is attacking Donald Trump, and Donald Trump is firing right back. And this is just the beginning. And as I predicted, as we made our uh, Precinct Caucus rundown, again, going to our YouTube uh, channel, well, we covered January 1st, just a couple of weeks ago, we covered the history of the Iowa caucuses and we analyzed the Democrats. And then uh, just two weeks ago, we had looked at uh, Republicans in Iowa. And what we're having now is that as we have two people who are, are close together in the polls, and not a single vote is cast yet. They're getting a little testy with each other. But guess what, folks? This is the process. Seriously, this is the way the political process works. And as much as I hear people complain about, oh, I hate all this negative advertising. Oh, can't they all get, just get along? The fact is, you get two people who are jockeying for the position of the highest office in the land, and they're going to get testy with each other and it, it becomes personal until there's some separation one way or the other. Ted Cruz, Donald Trump, they are locked in a very tight struggle. Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, that is starting to take a personal tone. They're locked in a personal struggle. And then you still have the other candidates like Marco Rubio and Ben Carson and uh, um, Jeb Bush they're all, and Chris Christie. They're all trying to jockey to get into the top two. So there's still a lot of stuff going on. But what will happen is things will start shaking out first in Iowa, then in New Hampshire, then in South Carolina and in Florida. And then we'll get the Super Tuesday and we have Minnesota for March 1st. And then about a week after here is when you know, the largest voting block, uh, voting blocks will have occurred uh, and you're going to start seeing candidates drop out and then you're going to start getting coal, both parties will coalesce behind a nominee. That's the way the process works. But we've got 51 more weeks and one of these people will be the president. It's just going to be interesting to see who that will be. And I was reminded I forgot to give you our Christmas countdown. There are only 336 days left shopping days left until 
Christmas 2016. Well, Donald Trump, speaking of, he did pick up a crucial uh, nomination, uh, in, uh, I mean, in, no, nomination, endorsement, uh, and that was former Alaska governor and former vice presidential candidate, uh, vice presidential uh, nominee, Sarah Palin. Here's what she had to say about Donald Trump. Only one candidate's record of success proves he is the master of the art of the deal. He is beholden to no one but we, the people. How refreshing. He is perfectly positioned to let you make America great again. Are you ready for that, Iowa? No more pussyfooting around. Our troops deserve the best. You deserve the best. He is from the private sector, not a politician. Can I get a hallelujah? hallelujah. <laughs> Where in the private sector you actually have to balance budgets in order to prioritize, to keep the main thing the main thing. And he knows the main thing. A president is to keep us safe economically and militarily. He knows the main thing and he knows how to lead the charge. So troops hang in there because help's on the way because he Better than anyone, isn't he known for being able to command fire? <laughs> Are you ready for a commander in chief? You ready for a commander in chief who will let our warriors do their job and go kick ISIS ass? Ready for someone who will secure our borders to secure our jobs and to secure our homes? ready to make America great again. Are you ready to stump for Trump? I'm here to support the next president of the United States, Donald Trump. So that was former Alaska Governor Sarah Palin. The thing about Sarah Palin, there's a couple of questions. One, has her time come? Does she still have the poll that she had in 2008? She was really popular in 08. And there were a lot of people who would make their endorsements based upon Sarah Palin's endorsement. But does that credibility still hold weight? I don't know. Um, the other thing is that, um, you know, why did she endorse Donald Trump and not Ted Cruz, who seems to be more ideological, uh, ideologically aligned with Governor Palin. I really think a lot of that comes back to the treatment that Sarah Palin received back in 2008. Uh, John McCain selected her. I don't think they really knew that she was going to be more popular than he was. And I think there was some jealousy there because I had heard a lot of stories about how John McCain's staffers had pretty much thrown Sarah Palin and her staffers under the bus and blamed her for losing even though it was really John McCain as the candidate uh, himself who really lost that presidential race and not really defending her when the news media, the national news media and the Obama machine had attacked her repeatedly over personal issues and I don't think that you know Palin's have really gotten over that and so here is an opportunity to throw one back in the face of the Republican Party. That, hey, I may be more ideologically aligned than Ted Cruz, but I'm going to support the guy that you don't like. And I really think that that's a lot of what the Palin endorsement for Donald Trump meant. Now the question, and we'll only find this out in the next ten, uh, nine days as we head in Iowa, is, is that going to be enough to put some separation between Cruz and Trump? And that's an unknown. I really don't know what Sarah Palin's appeal is amongst Republicans in Iowa, simply because of the passage of time. I mean, we've been at this point eight years ago, uh, and seven years ago, that yes, it w Palin definitely would have the pull. But after making a couple of attempts at dangling it out there that I might run for president, and then no, I'm not, people may have moved on. And it's going to be interesting to see what happens here. But that's not the only reason Sarah Palin was in the news this week. And there was another Palin who was also in the news, and that is her son, Track. Let's take a look. According to Wasilla, Alaska Police Department, Track Palin, the son of former vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin, was arrested Monday and charged with domestic violence and other counts. Police said in a statement that officers were called to a residence in Wasilla for a disturbance report at about 10 p.m. 
Police said in a statement that an investigation revealed Track Palin had committed a domestic violence assault on a female and possessed a firearm while intoxicated. The 26-year-old is scheduled to be arraigned Tuesday. It's really heartbreaking to hear that. I met Track Palin once um, during my military career and, you know, um, he and I had a nice short conversation just before he deployed to Iraq as an experienced non-commissioned officer who had already been over there. You know, I let him know a few things that he, you know, really needed to know before he left. And to see him arrested on charges like this, you know, really breaks my heart. But now let's take a look at what Sarah Palin has to say about this because she brought back into the political arena in a speech in Tulsa a day or two after addressing the uh, or endorsing Trump. Let's take a look. I can talk personally about this. I guess it's kind of an elephant in the room because my own family going through what we're going through today with my son, a combat vet, having served in a striker brigade, fighting for you all, America, in the war zone. But my son, like so many others, they come back a bit different. They come back hardened. They come back wondering if there is that respect for what it is that their fellow soldiers and airmen and every other member of the military so sacrificially have given to this country. And that starts from that, the top. It's a shame that our military personnel even have to wonder if they have to question if they're respected anymore. It starts from the top. The question, though, that comes from our own president, where they have to look at him and wonder, do you know what we go through? Do you know what we're trying to do to secure America and to secure the freedoms that have been bequeathed us? So when my own son is going through what he goes through coming back, I can certainly relate with other families who kind of feel these ramifications of some PTSD and some some of the woundedness that our soldiers do return with. And it makes me realize more than ever, it is now or never for the sake of America's finest that we have that commander in chief who will respect them and honor them. Okay, now I had heard a lot of comments about that portion of the speech. You know, what is Sarah Palin doing taking a family issue and making it political? Well, she's a politician, so you kind of expect that. But I think, the, you know, the other comments that I had heard this past week since this was announced was a discussion as to whether or not this was an excuse for Track's behavior and, or whether or not it justified Track's behavior. And I'm going to tell you, as a combat veteran from Iraq who also suffers from PTSD, which I do have, I can identify a little bit about track, you know, with what Track Palin's going through. I will say that it explains his behavior. It does not excuse his behavior. Um, that if the Palin family steps in and actually doesn't just make PTSD as an excuse for the behavior, but actually makes, you know, has track, have the, you know, get some reason gets track back on track and, you know, getting them into the professional care that he needs in order to overcome this and live a normal life that I've been able to do and others have been able to do. That's really going to be telling as to how that, that family operates and what happens in the future. Because post-traumatic stress disorder is a very serious issue, uh, but it is not a debilitating long-term issue if you don't want it to be, meaning that there is treatment available. And really that's, I think, the heart of today's um, message here. You know, it's something I've dealt with. I've had irritability. I've had nightmares. I've had sleep deprivation. Uh, I've dealt with it all. And even though my case was minor or, or was, um, no, it was minor compared to other more severe and advanced cases, you know, the intervention came in time. I had only lived with it for six years, not 30. Uh, but still, at the times that I was going through post-traumatic stress disorder, undiagnosed, I was irritable. I was sleep deprived, I had nightmares, 
I had anxiety. I had a lot of that going on. And in uh, 2009, I was diagnosed with it. And starting in January of 2010 was when I began the treatments. And now I'm a completely different person than I was back then. And it's simply because I've been able to understand and deal with those issues. And if there was hope for me, I can tell you that there's hope for track palin. Regardless of the fact that this is brought up in the you know, mantra of politics, regardless of whether or not people think that it may only be used as an excuse, the fact is we're dealing with a real person here. And my heart really does go out to track Palin, and I really hope that he does get the help that he needs. And if you're dealing with anything like this, and not just combat veterans, but you know, of, uh, if you're dealing with any type of trauma and you're dealing with some of these symptoms, I really hope that you do the right thing and get treated for this and get over it and try to get your life back. Because I do know there are a lot of people who are out there struggling, and I'm just here to tell you that it's not the end of the world. It will only be the end of the world if you choose to make it that way, but there's a whole lot more to life than that negative outlook. I'm gonna take a look right now at a whiteboard video that was put up by the Department of Veterans Affairs, the VA medical system, on um, what is PTSD. Have you or someone you love ever been in a tornado or car accident? Experienced sexual or physical abuse? Served in a war zone? Most people have been through some kind of life-threatening or traumatic event, and it's common to have stress-related reactions after a trauma. But when symptoms last more than three months and they're not getting better, it's time to get help. Meet Sam. He recently returned from serving in Iraq. For many people, being in a crowded place like a baseball stadium or a busy grocery store feels comfortable, but not for Sam. What should be a nice night out, taking his wife Tara to a restaurant, isn't fun for him anymore. He can only handle it if he sits with his back to the wall where he has a good view of the exits, and even then, he's too on edge to really enjoy it. At home, things aren't the way they used to be either. His sleep is restless at best, and some nights Tara isn't sure if Sam comes to bed at all. Sam seems to have a short fuse these days, and sometimes he snaps at Tara over tiny misunderstandings. What he and Tara never talk about is the trauma he experienced when he was deployed. He's never mentioned the guilt, the weight he carries around wishing he could have done more to prevent what happened. Instead, he's turned inward, pulling away from family and friends. Tara tried to give him some space, but after months passing without change, she really started to worry. She was the one to finally say what they were both thinking. It's time to get help. That's when Sam finally decided to take action. He reached out to a doctor who told him about PTSD, or post-traumatic stress disorder. Sam's symptoms were getting in the way of enjoying his life, re-experiencing, hyperarousal, Feeling worse about yourself or the world and avoidance are the four types of symptoms people with PTSD have. Sam's doctor explained each. The first is reliving the event or re-experiencing. This is often an unwanted memory or even a flashback where you feel like you're right back in the situation again. Seeing, hearing, or even smelling something that reminds you of the trauma can trigger these. Nightmares where you relive parts of the event in your sleep are common too. The second is avoidance, staying away from situations that remind you of the trauma. That's why Sam tries to avoid thinking about painful memories altogether. He pours himself into his work or uses alcohol to keep his mind from going back to the trauma. The third is feeling worse about yourself or the world since the trauma. You might feel overwhelming guilt like Sam or not trust anyone. You just might not be able to feel happy, even when you are around people you love. The fourth type of symptom is sudden rushes of anger, irritability, feeling jittery, always on alert, always on the lookout for danger. This is called hyperarousal, and loud noises or a driver cutting in front of you can be all it takes to set you off. If you recognize any of these symptoms of PTSD in yourself or someone you love, don't wait. See your doctor to find out if it could be PTSD. Just like Sam and Tara found, there is hope. You don't have to live with the symptoms of PTSD forever. Effective treatments are available. To learn more about PTSD or how to get help, 
visit the National Center for PTSD website at www.ptsd.va.gov. And that is an ex uh, I think it's a pretty good explanation of what a lot of people are dealing with. And like I say, even though you know you hear PTSD with you know veterans, combat veterans, it doesn't just mean military veterans. It's also people who are you know victims of really any traumatic situation. And yet there is hope. And there's a lot of hope out there. But at the same time, if you are dealing with these issues, you know, it's up to you to take that next step. That You're going to want to get better. And I'm going to show one more uh, video here on explaining PTSD. And, and part, um, part of this is with uh, Dr. Frank Oakberg uh, from Michigan State University. Dr. Oakberg was one of the people who wrote the initial protocols for the diagnosis and treatment of PTSD. Let's take a look at what he has to say. The goal of this program is to introduce clinicians, therapists, and mental health professionals to post-traumatic stress disorder, to help them learn what PTSD is, how it affects sufferers and their families, and how best to explain what PTSD is in a clinical setting. Dr. Frank Ockberg is a psychiatrist and former associate director of the National Institute of Mental Health. He is one of the team members who wrote the medical definition for post-traumatic stress disorder. Dr. Ogberg was the editor of the first treatment text in America for PTSD and is a recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies. Dr. Angie Panos holds a PhD in clinical psychology. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist and a licensed clinical social worker. She has more than 20 years experience in traumatic stress treatment, dealing with war refugees, domestic violence, victims of rape, and child abuse. Dr. Ogberg and Dr. Panos are friends of Gift From Within. Historically, PTSD has been referred to as depression, anxiety disorder, paranoia, or battle fatigue. It has only been recently that the symptoms were seen in the larger context of post-traumatic stress disorder. Why is it important for clinicians to understand how to explain PTSD? It's very important for clinicians to understand how to explain post-traumatic stress disorder to their clients because they're setting the foundation for the information that that person needs to know to guide them in their healing and recovery process. Explaining PTSD is, is actually an important part of treating PTSD. Uh, you're dealing with a situation that can be baffling to your patient, your client. Uh, they want to know that you are familiar with this. They want to know that when they talk with you about the event that happened to them, you're going to be able to handle it. PTSD is insidious and can be particularly difficult to discern. What is PTSD? Post-traumatic stress disorder is three things at once. First, being haunted by the event. The memory of the event, the sensations, the feeling of the event comes back when you don't expect it, when you don't want it. It, it can wake you up in the middle of the night. It, it can be like a hallucination during the day. The second part of PTSD is almost the opposite of the first. It, it's having emotional anesthesia. You, you don't feel. You're a diminished human being. You might think of this as something that fortunately protects you from feeling horror and terror, but unfortunately it robs you of joy and hope and love. And the last part of PTSD is like having too much adrenaline. You are jumpy, you're nervous, you can't concentrate, you don't sleep well. All those th things happening for at least a month are diagnosed as PTSD. Well, that's uh, a good rundown. Uh, in my own situation, as we've got about five minutes left here, my own situation, you know, when I had experienced some traumatic situations, I've even talked about them on this show on occasion 
You know, I had a 107 millimeter rocket round land anywhere between 30 and 50 feet away from me. It uh, threw me against a wall, tore out my hearing. It was all the shock wave, the concussion blast. And, you know, I also lost people that were close to me. Uh, special, uh, Army Specialist um, Holly Mago. As a matter of fact, uh, the anniversary of her death is coming up next week. Uh, also lost Sergeant Michael Yashinsky on Christmas Eve 2003. Uh, Holly had passed away on uh, January 31st of 2004. And the thing is, I, I live with this every day. I used to have nightmares. Uh, they were pretty severe. I, you know, we talks about emotional anesthesia. It robs you of joy, hope, and love. Yes, it robbed me. And then, of course, the hyperactivity, that, that uh, sensitivity, having your radar out there. Yeah, that was me all the time. One thing he doesn't really go into, and this was in my case, because I didn't, and it's a rationalization, and it's in, internalized. You, you rationalize with yourself. You say, well, I get a nightmare, and I don't like my nightmare, so if I don't want a nightmare, then I might as well just stay up. I don't want to go to sleep because I'm going to have a nightmare. And that's an avoidance. But what happens if you don't sleep? Then you're running around in a state of chronic sleep deprivation. And that sleep deprivation only makes you feel that much more numb. And it only makes what's a little molehill seem to be a huge mountain. And then you're dealing with a civilian populace that just doesn't understand what's gone on overseas in the combat zone. You seek out only fellow veterans, but they only now have to be combat veterans because they understand where you've been. When I first came home, I had people who would, in, in my own unit, who would say, you've changed, you're different. Of course, I'd laugh it off and say, well, yeah, I mean, I've just been shot at for the last number of months. Of course I'm different. Uh, you know, I'm in combat now. It's a different role. You, you haven't been there. But over time, and it really took about six months for the symptoms to really manifest themselves within me. And that's when I actually had a nervous breakdown and I didn't know what I was dealing with. And then, of course, at that time I went into the clinic and I was pretty much told, oh, well, you've just been in uniform too long. Take six weeks off. Well, that didn't solve the problem because the problems were deeper than that. And I lived with it for six years. And six years of feeling run down, you know, that's a serious problem. And it does take, I will tell you this, it does take a long time to get back on track. You know, in order to have a balanced life, it really does take a long time. But remember this, you didn't get there overnight. Yes, the incident may have occurred in one flash of an instant, but the chronic symptoms and the sleep deprivation and you know the emotional detachment the as uh, Dr. Oakberg says emotional anesthesia that all didn't happen overnight that happens over the course of time and treatment is not going to happen overnight it's not like a broken leg where you put on a splint and say six weeks call me later we'll take it off or, or put on a cast it doesn't quite work that way in the PTSD world but there is hope and so, you know, that's pretty much, you know, where I think that Sarah Palin's son track does have serious issues. I identify with those issues. They should not be excuses. But I really hope that the Palin family uses this opportunity to take it out of the political world and get him the medical attention that he needs in order to have long-term health and success. And if you're dealing with this, I hope you do too. That's our show. See you next week.